It's February 21st, 2024, and this is Tabletop Throwdown. I'm Mike Dunn, Editor-in-Chief at Gaming Trend, and tonight with talking news with me is Dan Hinkin and Mark Julian, my lead editors. And yeah, let's talk some news. <laughs> let's talk some news. Let's do it. Yes. All right, first up, Simon signs exclusivity deal with GameFound. Company leaves the platform that made it millions. Mm-hmm. So this was probably the biggest news of the week. Um, they have been dipping their toes into GameFound. Uh, they've done it a couple of times now. The first uh, campaign they did was the Masters of the Universe campaign last year, uh, which made a, over 700000 it's a pretty good start. Um, and currently uh, running, I believe right now, is uh, the Fire and Ice Tactics game, uh, the Game of Thrones themed uh, tactical battle game. Um, and it's already over 1 million. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that might be a, might be a good move. They, they, they probably won't skip a beat, right? Um, that said, they did make roughly a uh, hundred million and on nearly sixty projects on Kickstarter. Like, yeah, it's a little, <laughs> little bit of money. Yeah. yeah, just a little bit. Well, you see, you've seen a lot so, more. Like, yeah, you've seen a lot more companies that are even like they're moving to Game Found. Um, I mean, even on the back end, it seems like a lot more of the you know the the stores and the you know the pledge managers and everything is kind of moving that way um i'm not sure what it looks like on the back end uh for publishers and different things but it just seems like it's a better experience that people are having over there um with with some of those things and then especially with you bring you know simons and they're they're known for their miniatures i just know all of the crazy miniatures from all the games that i played of theirs um and all the add-ons and the different things i think it's a it's going to be a, a money maker for game found i think they, it's a it's a pretty great partner and see what other companies are going to follow suit yeah i think one of the also great benefits of game found is that it's dedicated to our mm-hmm. hobby whereas yeah. kickstarter you know you can filter to tabletop but it caters to all kinds of crowdfunding uh, and having a more focused experience with GameFound is nice. And the, the interface with GameFound that shows you, Hey, here's active projects. Here's all the projects that finish, but you can still right. pledge. Uh, it's much easier to see, Hey, here's everything you have the option of getting involved in versus uh, the kind of endless scroll on Kickstarter. I feel like some, some things can get lost, not to mention the search function that just does not work at all. Uh, on Kickstarter, GameFound makes it much easier to find everything. So that yeah, you're Game for. GameFound originally started off as like a post Kickstarter mm-hmm. uh, yeah, piece of software, you know, sort of like an alternative to backer kit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one of the things that they did innovate was the uh, post campaign pledge, right? The the mm-hmm. thing where all right, so the campaign's over, but you can still get on and, and get, get a game, uh, get a pledge in, um, after the fact, of course it's, you know, locked in, uh, to whatever, however, the, uh, the pledge, the campaign ended, but, uh, until, until, uh, that, until things reach a point where they're about to start shipping, uh, or, or like taking it into production, uh, you, they enable it so that you can still jump on board. Uh, which is pretty cool. Um, and yeah, it about, I think it was like about last year or, or the year before they announced that they were going to, uh, do the, the campaigns themselves. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, uh, it was a big announcement. They had a few companies, uh, most notably Cephalo fair with their, uh, their big Kickstarter. Actually, I think it was last year. It was last summer, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. With the RPG and the yeah, with the RPG, yeah, the, the reprint of Frosthaven, the, uh, the small box. second edition. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah the, the second edition of Gloomhaven, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, that, that was a big get for them. Um, and I believe there were one or two other companies. Can't, can't remember off the top of my head that announced that were joined in on that, that announcement. So yeah. Uh, yeah, it really looks like the platform is gaining traction and, 
I think it's a great platform. Uh, it really does. It really is tabletop centric. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I think, I think what Mark, Mark was saying, uh, I, I know I've mentioned this before. I think all it needs is an app. Um, yep. you know, if we can get an app, it's gonna, I think it's going to be an easy sell for a lot of publishers to start putting their products on there. Have yeah, we about. should uh, we should we should talk with them uh, at Gamma this year to see if that's on the on the horizon. Absolutely, I can't imagine it won't be. Yeah, well, a lot of people scroll social media, and I just scroll Kickstarter because I just want to see the games, even if it's yeah. you know I'm not looking to back anything. I just want to see what's on there. So if Game yeah. Found had an app, I'd be scrolling on there, and I'm, you know I, you know I'm going to see things I want to get. So mm-hmm. oh yeah, uh, got mm-hmm. got to get the app. But the website is great. Yeah. For sure. Asmodee leads profits for parent company Embracer Group, surpassing the video game segment for the first time. Uh, The tabletop giant escapes the chopping block for now amidst the cancellation of 29 video games and over 1,400 layoffs and studio closures in the last six months alone. Um. So I don't know uh, if you've been following anything in the gaming industry at all these, uh, I guess, since like December. Uh, But there's been a huge amount of layoffs and closures and all kinds of stuff. Uh, It's it's basically been a bloodbath. And Embracer Group has been at the forefront of this. (laughs) Like they really have uh, have done a lot to, I don't know, just... Uh, send a lot of video game folks uh, to the unemployment lines. Um, now, Asmodee seems to have avoided this, though, mostly because their sales were up 7% to $420 million last year, mm. while PC and console sales were down 5%. In fact, Embracer as a whole fell by 4%. Mm. Um, so... Like I, I've been saying for years now that uh, tabletop is 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 you know approaching the level that video games did when they they main they transitioned into the mainstream, and Asmodee topping like all of the video game companies within just this one parent company uh, certainly feels like a testament to that. Um, so uh, I think that's pretty cool. I think it's, yeah, it's interesting because you'd think the video games is a larger market. At least that's my assumption. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I was playing uh, Skull and Bones earlier today, and there's a lot of complaints around it's a seventy dollar video game, uh, at least on consoles. And you know, but then Ubisoft is is saying you know, but you're going to get you know hundreds of hours out of it. And they're kind of resistance to feel like I'm going to pay seventy dollars, but am I going to get a hundred hours or two hundred hours? Of, like video game people want that, but tabletop, we've got no problem backing a Kickstarter all in for four hundred dollars, and we might not ever play it. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's, you, it's kind of a weird thing going on there. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's something to be said for the profit margins, right? Like, right. Uh, I would imagine that they probably aren't too terribly different. You know, you've got a lot of physical components, but developing a video game takes a lot of people and a yeah. lot of time. And, um, and you know, there's like, you know, game engine licenses, et cetera. Uh, but, but yeah, I- Embracer, uh, there's not a, not a very good opinion of Embracer. And, and, and it, it's been that way actually for a little while because uh, they, one of the reasons that is probably why they're they're uh, doing this kind of restructuring uh, or these extensive cuts for the last six months uh, is because last year they they in the, like in the last minute they lost a major deal with Savvy Games, a company uh, out of Saudi Arabia. Mm-hmm. Um, it fell through at the last minute, and um, they had already previously uh taken a billion from them um and there was a lot of outrage about that uh yeah. so um, what i think i think when it comes to like asthma day um i 
I was always conflicted because, you know, you want small businesses to thrive and you want those, um, you know, what those small companies to kind of, you know, to, to be able to do their own self-sufficient marketing, everything. But when you get a big company like Asmodee, who has taken a whole lot of properties under their wing, you get the, the force of a big company behind them. And when I think of Asmodee, I think of some of like the, the great entry level type of games from the companies mm-hmm. that they've acquired, you know, days of wonder. They've got the Catan uniform, uh, uh, universe. They've got right. fantasy flight games, which has star Wars. It has all these great things. And I mean, with Star Wars Unlimited coming out, I could see those profit margins going way up with, the, you know, another, um, you know, a game that people want to play with a, with a, with a theme that people want to want to go with. And so, you know, I, I, I can, I can see why Asmodee is doing what it's doing because you have so many people who are finding this hobby for the first time and they're looking for those entry level things. Um, and they just have a lot of the, the, the backing and some of those, those great entry level products that you kind of see everywhere. So, yeah, you get, you get, you know, savings, uh, when you combine like that with marketing yeah. and shipping and mm-hmm. warehouse storage and all those things, which are great. Uh, but then with, you know, the big kind of, overarching company of embracer you know all, all the downsides of being owned by an investment company rather than yeah. a game yeah. company so you know well, trade-offs and, and, and then also like uh as, like i was uh, the so the past few years have been really interesting watching asmodee right like mm-hmm. uh i have jokingly referred to them as the ea of the yeah. tabletop world right uh but i'm citing uh like history of ea gobbling up small Mm -hmm. smaller companies and like bringing them in and then like asmodee hasn't really done this yet but like i feel like i've been waiting for the other shoe to drop where they start like dissolving those companies and Mm. and uh you know trying to increase their bottom line but or or uh you know increase their profits through uh dissolving Mm -hmm. companies and 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 putting people out of work and putting games out of production. But um, honestly, I've been a little worried in the last year because their presence at conventions has been much more muted Mm. than in previous years. And uh, our poor rep uh, seems to have been like, I'm citing Gen Con specifically, but our poor rep, I won't mention her name. uh, It seems like she was handling all of the different companies by Mm. herself uh, for the Uh, most part in regards to interfacing with the press. And as a result, it's uh, it's, it meant that we were covering asthma day a little bit less just because, you know, there's only so much one person can do. Right. Right. Um, But yeah, embracer says they are in the final stretch of restructuring uh, and they're pretty much signaling more possible divestments and consolidation. Hmm. Uh, which is very ominous, <laughs> yeah. especially, especially if they turn their sights uh, on asthma day, but it appears they are safe for now. So. Yeah, for sure. Everybody well, better pre-order another box of star Wars unlimited in order to keep <laughs> asthma day. Uh, well, that's afloat. the other thing too, right? Like they bought atomic mass games and handed over, their minis based star Wars lines to them. Mm -hmm. They pulled them away from fantasy flight and gave them directly to atomic mass. And, uh, and so that, that was something that was, was very notable when that happened. It's like, Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, there, you don't usually see a company give, you don't usually see that happen. I mean, it's very strange. And it really kind of increased atomic masses, like visibility and footprint in the industry too. For sure. Um, but For uh, sure. given the upcoming release of, uh, well, uh, not the upcoming, but the, uh, the recent release of Shatterpoint and uh, yeah. some other stuff that they've got in the pipeline there. Uh, I think it's a, it's definitely a good thing for atomic mass and those games because they tended to get lost in the shuffle uh, during final during Fantasy Flight's uh, um, announcements and, yeah. and press. So, um, but yeah, uh, you got to wonder what's going on with Fantasy Flight right now under this kind of leadership. Uh, little, little, 
making me a little nervous. But. Yeah. Well, Fantasy Flight's got some great properties, though. I mean, I know they've been reboxing a lot of the Arkham Horror, um, the card game, you know, and they're about to release. They just released another expansion for for that, and they've been reboxing Lord of the Rings um, yep. and re- re-releasing the the sagas and getting some new players into that. I've seen that that resurgence, and of course, yeah, Star Wars Unlimited, which I got to play again on Saturday. I was really excited, and so I'm yeah. excited for and, all my pre- uh, pre-order stuff. So. They just announced uh, Age of Apocalypse for Marvel Champions. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. so, so that's oh yeah, Marvel Champions too. too, big one. This nice. are some big properties for the the living card game. So, yeah. Yeah. okay, well that's all the news we have this week. Uh, let's let's dive into our topic of the week, our interview with uh, Gooey Cubes Alphinius Goo. But first, a word from our sponsor. Ironically enough, Gooey Cube. Hey there, Mike Dunn, Editor-in-Chief of Tabletop, and I've got something very special to tell you about. It's a new crowdfunding campaign from Gooey Cube. It's called The Tomb of Geisengax. It's a tribute to Gary Gygax and many of the legends that created the wonderful game that we all love to play. The link is right down here. Go hit it up, back it. You can't go wrong. Okay, so tonight we have a special guest and a special guest host uh, with us. I'm going to introduce you guys to them right now. Uh, We've got... Alphinius Goo, the High Wizard of Zyathe and purveyor of all things Gooey Cube. Uh, he is our special guest. He's going to tell us about Zyathe, Gooey Cube, and an upcoming crowdfunding uh, adventure that is just around the corner uh, that we're going to tell you lots about. Uh, to help me do that is our one of our senior editors, senior tabletop editors, Stephen Starkey. Uh, it's been a while since Stephen and I have been on camera together, uh, but uh, it's pretty cool. Thanks, thanks, uh, thanks for helping me out, Steve. They nice are, to be here. They are both here to accost me. I don't even know what the questions are. I mean, I'm really <laughs> afraid right now. <laughs> See, that's that's the secret. I have prepared no questions. I am <laughs> I am off the cuff, as they say. So, Alphinius, uh, tell us about the world of Zyathe, and like, give us give us like a primer. Like, I, I, I would love to. I would love to. By the way, by the way, Mike, it's good to see you. And hello, Stephen. <laughs> thank you. It's great to meet you. Um, and thank you for, for having this old wizard hang out with you tonight. This is magnificent. So. No, it's fantastic. The pleasure is all ours, sir. Well, people don't know it, but Mike and I actually play games together. Yes, at my house. Yes, we do. Yes, yes. I haven't killed his character yet, but if it goes wrong tonight. <laughs> yes, if it goes wrong tonight. <laughs> yes, yes. A lot's on the line. So be sure to hit that like and subscribe button. <laughs> yes, yes. Give lots of likes and subscribes on Mike's character. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're going to do like a mid 80s uh like comic book where you vote whether Robin lives or dies thing. <laughs> yeah. uh, we could do that. Actually, we could yeah. actually vote in the I little like chat thing down below to see what happens and I will yeah. keep it uh, keep tabs upon it as they say. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no truly, my friends, it's a pleasure. Thank you for for having me on and and being able to talk about stuff and so, so I, to tell you about Zyothe, I got to go back just a little bit. And feel free to interrupt, because I can get long-winded. Okay? So feel free to interrupt. Um, but, I, will, I will interrupt with either questions or bad jokes, I assure you. <laughs> and both are most welcome. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what about you, Stephen? Um, I'm side-eyeing you right now. <laughs> My jokes are really bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, we anyway. keep him re- in reserve for when things like get on the ropes. You know, <laughs> he's the emergency <laughs> backup. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> anyway, no, no. So, so you have to go back to my youth. Do you mind if I just t- share a little bit of a story so you so you, you can kind of know? Please do, so, please do. So it's the 1970s, and a friend of mine says, "Have you ever heard of Dungeons and Dragons?" And I go, "Yeah, I've heard of Dungeons and Dragons." Because would you like to play? And so I went out from my home in Oakland to Castro Valley in the Bay Area and played an amazing game that was in this little white box and it was a lot of fun. And we played a little bit here and there. And then as time progressed, um, I, I went to a session and, and because the timing is such, I, I want to bring this up, um, uh, 
the adventure that we played was called Dark Tower. And Dark Tower uh, was written by marvelous Janelle Jaquez, who we just, just lost recently. And I, I must give all credit to Janelle for actually hooking me into really playing Dungeons & Dragons because Dark Tower was magnificent. Before its time, just if you've never played it, it's still relevant today. It's still a phenomenal adventure. Um, if you haven't played it, you should play it. So anyway, so we start playing at like 4 o'clock. We eat like McDonald's or something like that at like 6, right? And one of our friends went and grabbed grab McDonald's. And it's 4 o'clock in the morning and we finally stop playing, right? And so now, now, I, you know, now it's in there, right? It's like this, right? <laughs> so, so then I began to explore versus just coming and playing with the friends. You know what I'm saying? So now I'm really exploring. I'm going to game stores. I'm buying miniatures. And um, somewhere around that time, because we didn't really have, we had, we had a world, but we didn't really have a world, right? It wasn't, it was Greyhawk was there, but we didn't really have a world. And I buy this thing called Water Deep in the North by Ed Greenwood. And it is magnificent. It is, it is, you know, and if you've been reading the Dragon Magazine, you've seen some of Ed's things, you know, all this stuff has been happening, mm -hmm. right? And all of a sudden, the, the possibilities of a world that really have has depth and and breadth and all of this stuff that we loved about the forgotten realms and and many many still love today including myself and when we began this journey in 2018 um i i said if it's not as good as or better than the forgotten realms i don't want to do it and so we began to envision um a world that is a little more corrupt a little more grim, dark, um, perhaps, perhaps a little more, um, more intriguing for a, an audience of today, um, a little more scary, uh, but also humor and fun and all of the kind of stuff that you come to expect. And so we have this wonderful corrupted world of Zayathe where magic is actually broken and is actually um, contributing, contributing to the destruction of the world. And that is the foundational thing of, of Zayathe, is that corrupted magic is, is a bad thing and a good thing. And we, we love the, the conundrum of it for players and for game masters and all of that stuff. How'd I do? <laughs> oh, I can't hear you, Mike. <laughs> yeah, because I had the mute on because I didn't want to make any sound. <clears throat> No shanting. See, this is... Yeah, I was shanting. Um, <laughs> That's an inside joke. <laughs> it is, it is, because we didn't record that part. That was leading up to it. Um, no, so... Uh, so, I guess, like, how long after you started playing did you start DMing? So, it was around that that time of Dark Tower. Because that's also when I got the the bug. I really, really got the bug. I've been playing in the '70s, but I think Dark Tower came out '79 or '80 or something like that, and that's really mm -hmm. when I got the bug. And um, and it was around that time. And I loved game mastering. I loved this whole this whole dungeon master thing. Uh, it was so fun to prepare and be able to create, right? And and really for us, we already were down the road with. Um, it, it, even in those days of having sort of character driven storylines and all of that kind of stuff that, that's mm -hmm. become more popular now uh, so, uh, over the last probably t two decades or so. Um, we were already down that road and we were down in, in, in modules, you know, that really stretched us um, to, to actually, I mean, I, you know, to think about the idea. So you have to understand you're a kid in, in it's 1980. And you play this marvelous adventure called Ravenloft, okay? Now, up until this time, I don't know if it was 80, but it was in that time frame, you know, was, I don't remember exactly when. But up until this time, Definitely you walk down 80s. the hallway, you knock down a door, you killed a monster. You walk down a doorway, you, you knock down mm -hmm. a door, you killed a monster. That was a lot of what happened with the game. And all of a sudden, with this marvelous thing called Ravenloft, you were introduced to the idea that monsters could move around, that monsters could actually 
do other things. They they would they would react while the other thing and that that all of that stuff is all this contribution to the wonderfulness of this game that we all love. Right? Is this is the the fact that it feels real, the fact that you could believe it and you're living there and all of that stuff. And I began game mastering in that time frame, and we just we began reading books and doing all of that kind of stuff, and it was it was so uh, wonderful. There's n never been a game for me like no. like this game. Um, I don't know what happened there. Sorry, but Mike snapped his yeah, finger. Yeah, no, no, my my wife, door. my wife. The door. <laughs> I was waving off someone who came to the basement. <laughs> Hark! There's something at the door. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, uh, so, 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 yeah, I remember a lot of that. I think uh, I see. I, I seem to recall uh, Ravenloft coming out like eighty one, eighty two. I think so. Um, in that time frame. Does that does that sound right to you, Stephen? Stephen, so little. Here's something about Stephen. No. Stephen is actually our official D and D historian at Gaming Trend. <laughs> and, and I appreciate Sounds like a the raise title. is in order for all the people, <laughs> Stephen. <laughs> so I, I am not going to run down to the basement and dig through the the books, but I think that that's about accurate. Yeah. 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 And and what's funny is that the way I remember it is I remember when the artists like mm. started showing up. Like that's that is how time is measured in D and D world in my brain yeah. because that's what what hooked me probably uh, before anything else was was the art that was associated with it. Um, well, and you know I mean, like, even, that, that's what we love, right? That's one of the things that that we believe kind of sets us apart is this this idea that is old school made new right that yes so we have anyway i, I don't know where you're going but that that's definitely core and part and parcel to what we believe at gui q well i was so i actually that was just more of a tangent of like my own thoughts um uh but but yeah no absolutely absolutely uh and we we will talk more about that here in a bit um but what i want to do is i want to kind of keep on poking and digging at these early early days of Zyathe, the world that you've created, that all of the adventures that uh, you and the Gooey Cube community collaborate on. Um, uh, I guess, uh, was, was Zyathe your original world that you created? It, it was, uh, yes. Like, back, back then, your answer to, like, a Greyhawk? No. No, because the Forgotten Realms was for a long time where we played and ventured. Gotcha. Now, over time, it became much more my Forgotten Realms, right? Which it should right. for any game master, right? You want to kind of make it your own and bring your own creativity to it. And I liked a little more Grimdark than the Forgotten Realms certainly was in those days. And even today is not as, as Grimdark, you know. Um, I liked I liked more intensity and, and, mm -hmm. and, and really this idea of, of, man, this is scary. And... and, and that it's okay once in a while to lose a character, right? It's not, uh, you know, it's not taboo. You can't ever lose a character. Some of the things that, that for me made, I think, the game more interesting and better for players and better for me as a game master. So the Forgotten Realms began to migrate and morph over time. And then we really walked down the road. Um, I walked down the road of, of some fairly significant adjustments. Um, I, I didn't really want to have uh, an, a lot of animal... Um, uh, personages, um, uh, people of animal heritages, and those kinds of things. Uh, I wanted uh, more, mm -hmm. uh, more. I did. So I, what I didn't want to do with Zayathe was just rehash the Forgotten Realms, right? Which a lot of, not a lot, but some folks right. have in, in world creation. And that was where the, the the corrupted magics came. That's where the Lords of Corruption came from, which was the mistake of Avova and a bunch of wonderful backstory lore. Which I think is very important. Whenever you're, if you're watching and you're thinking about creating a world, uh, to, if I can give any any suggestion to you to, that you that you will remember as you build it, is start with the beginning. Start with the beginning, and understand what the end is, because your foundation is critical to the to the everything else that comes thereafter. And so the foundation of Zayathe is there was a a creator being called Avova. And Avova spoke all of this 
this stuff into into being but at the same time of speaking all of this stuff into being four strange sparks of corruption formed on the edge of the void which were not of the creator's desire those then became the lords of corruption who became antithetical to avova and conflict as we know in any kind of a good tale is very important and so that that began to breathe everything. We even have uh, names for our our atoms. They are called alims. So it's really weird. I mean, we got kind of got to a little to it, a, 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 a bit too deep. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, as as below, so above, and vice versa, right? Yes, um, indeed. You know. Uh, so what uh, what would you say were your were your biggest influences when you were coming up with some of these, these concepts, you know, this is a pretty non, like, especially, especially for like the, the fantasy worlds that we grew up with, like Lord of the Rings and then forgotten realms and, um, and everything. Um, uh, like this is, this is very different, very different. Um, what would what were some of your inspirations? Where where did you draw inspiration from for some of these ideas? Well, first and foremost, you know, I've already mentioned Ed Greenwood's marvelous Forgotten Realms, which unequivocally was the foundational world in which we lived. Certainly, Greyhawk spoke into it some as well. Um, the the magnificent Ravenloft thing, right? Because I like grimdark and I like horror and I like to bring those elements, even though I don't want Zayathe to be a horror world. I want it to be um, a a grim, dark, and scary world, but I don't want it to be all focused on sort of uh, just vampires and you know and and sort of all of the even the non-traditional horror. I really wanted it to be uh, more broad than that. Right. Um, and so obviously, uh, from an adventuring standpoint, Janelle Jaquez, I love both Dark Tower and the Caverns of Theresia, uh, which again, both of those I believe were well way before their time in terms of what they did. But Grey, you know, as I mentioned, Greyhawk. But also, I I went back and read um, the first fantasy campaign by Dave Arneson, which was a magnificent uh, thing. Um, you know, uh, uh, I spent a little time in Eberron. You know, I I I've danced around with um, with uh, you know more than a few. And then when you take all of the fiction that you've read, right, all of the various worlds that you've looked at from you know, popularized Game of Thrones, but a magnificent, a magnificent world created there. And, mm. and I think as you, as you begin to coalesce in your mind, sort of what are the, the foundational principles of the world, that leads to the foundational lore of the world. And the foundational lore of the world gives you something that hopefully, if you've done it well, it makes it somewhat unique and interesting for those who, who encounter it. So those are really the, the majority of my inspirations. But Mike, you know this. You know, I, I take inspiration mm. from so many places. I, oh, yeah. In my real life, my day job, I'm a creative director in, in the advertising world, and I've been around wonderful creative people. My name's, my real name's Kim, and I've been around wonderful creative people all my life. I'm talking to two of them right now. You know, I just have been so blessed to, to know so many people who draw things and write things and, and art things and you know, and, and sing things and all of this stuff. And it just, it just infuses you. And that's why I love, just love being around creative people. Okay, Alphineas is back. I apologize for that, friends. But that, uh, <laughs> yes, now, now you know I don't have a British accent and the British accent is totally fake and terrible. <laughs> I have a question about um, other gaming systems. Have you played other, other systems other than D&D? &D? And has maybe that helped to influence things too? Yes, we, we, uh, we, it's funny, you know, Tunnels and Trolls, we played that for a while in my youth, um, which was nice. really fun, you know, it was really, really fun. Rune Quest, uh, you all, have you all played any Rune Quest in the course of your, uh, in the course of your lives? Uh, do you even know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I, I have not played Rune Quest. <laughs> I played, yeah, uh, I've, I think I paged through one of the manuals once. I, yep, I played, I played Rune Quest, I played GURPS, which, um, which I actually, uh, the system was uh, was a little complex, but it was actually pretty good. Um, <laughs> I played at Pathfinder for a number of years, actually. So, so Stephen and I have a funny GURP story. Ah, <laughs> <Yeah. no. laughs> we we actually got a, a demo. I think it was like '88. 
88 at uh, at AggieCon uh, down in Texas, um, and we got a demo of GURPS at AggieCon, and both of us did not care for it. Yeah, and, but it was Steve Jackson that demoed it too. Yeah, Steve Jackson himself demoed it. <laughs> and we were but like, it was, oh, okay. I think it was still, it was still in the, it was still it in was prototype new. form. Yeah. So, um, you know. But like you couldn't tell that to like a sixteen-year-old kid. Right? <laughs> well, well, I didn't like that, you know. <laughs> Just, um, but uh, but yeah, I know. And plus, it's obviously it's gone through so many iterations since then. Uh, it's obviously better than what we played at, you know, by this but point. Every one of those experiences that you have like that is a is a key learning experience too mm -hmm. for creativity for DMing and stuff. I I distinctly remember in that game he was describing an, a something and he described it as having the consistency of bone marrow, and I had no <laughs> idea what the consistency of bone marrow was. So I was like, well, this is a useless reference for me, which helped me in the future to think about. Yes, it was in keeping with the setting, but it wasn't useful to the players. So. Yes, that's very, very astute, uh, Stephen. Because you're right. It, it, relevancy is critical, right? If if you don't if you don't understand if you don't if you draw a picture that is uh, it, that people have no understanding what it is, right? And and they can't really understand what the picture is, right? It doesn't help, right? So you're exactly right. Mm -hmm. You've got to you got to ground. If you're not grounded, then it, it doesn't have nearly the impact that it that it could have, right? Very so um, speaking Pathfinder, of other systems, Pathfinder Two, uh, by the way, Mike. Oh yeah, no. Uh, so we we've actually got I've got uh, one of my editors uh, reviewing that right now, uh, and uh, the two new core books that are coming out this year were part of our top ten uh, most anticipated mm -hmm. games of the year, uh, which um, uh, was our first podcast episode topic. Um, but uh, actually, Kim, uh, Alphinius, Kim, uh, last year uh, you and I got a chance to play something other than D and D. Uh, at Genghis Khan, uh, yes. almost World. almost exactly a year ago, uh, Savage Worlds, and I really really liked it. Um, there was there was a, a, a simultaneously like a depth and a simplicity yes. that really resonated with me, uh, and I loved the cards uh, component of it. Uh, and actually, um, I ended up backing a crowdfunding. Uh, uh, campaign for actual hardcover editions of the books of the rules because it's like an open source yes. RPG, right? Mm -hmm. yes. um, and I wanted something. I wanted a, a big beefy book, right? So <laughs> I found a way to get a. Be I don't have it yet, but um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to. I, I, I want to play more of that. Um, yes. Well, hopefully, that was super you know, fun. Harry's going to be at um, who is the game master we played with it was Harry, I believe. Yes, and um, and he's going to be at Genghis Khan, so maybe we can grab him for a late night game. Grab Steven and drag him, drag him along with us. Um, oh yeah, I'm easy to drag places. I'm very yeah. small. <laughs> Steven's going to be a captive audience next week for sure. Um, I, I have scheduled everything. Uh, ah, but <clears throat> you're yes. doing the game. You're coming to the game show. Yes. Oh yes, yes, mm -hmm. uh, yes. So I will be appearing in the Great Gooey Dungeon Game Show. For the third time, third, third time, time. Yes. yes. Um, and uh, I might even uh be dressed up for it, so ah. uh, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully, we'll get some uh, some coverage of that up on the site. Uh, uh, when that happens, uh, I think that would be cool because uh, I would love for uh, I would love for our readers and our viewers to experience that. I think that would be be an awesome thing. Uh, it is very cool. Uh, well, I got to tell you, Mike, um, it looks like we're on the big stage at Gen Con this year for the Great Gooey Dungeon Game Show. Nice. So that is fantastic. Deal. Now we got to put a thousand people in the room instead of three hundred. That scares I, me. You know, you had that room. You had that room cram packed, and people were Perfect. dipping in and out of it the whole time. So uh, it was indeed. <laughs> but um, but but let's get back. Let's get back to the topic at hand. So you told us about Zyathe, like when you started creating Zyathe. Um but right now you you've been doing this uh, as GUI Cube for a few years, and you have several adventures, uh, adventure kits, 
and several uh, books uh, of lore and uh, additional rules and classes and, and, and races that you've created for this world. Um, what, I guess, what, uh, what do you think is the, the best part of like how Zyathe has changed and, and the way it is today compared to uh, Zyathe as it has existed over the years before that? So, Mike, the thing I love most about everything that we're doing at GUIQ is the involvement of our community. So, as you know, right, because you, you've been around, right, as you know, mm -hmm. we have given new authors who've never been published before the chance to write things. Um, and we have not done it with the promise of, yes, you'll get to write this and we'll expose you. We have paid them, right? Um, we, mm -hmm. we've, uh, we've given our community the opportunity to make literally hundreds of monsters as submissions so that when we do our monster, monster our first monster, monster book, uh, many of those monsters, probably more than half of them, will be, have been created by our community members. We take submissions through our Contributors Guild and add those into the lore books and, the, and those kinds of things. And we even have, gosh, I don't know, 300, 400 portraits of characters who were made from the likeness of our friends and fans who are appearing in the world as non-player characters. So it is, it is, this is something that I've never seen before. It kind of yeah. came over the blue and, and it just, for me, it's incredibly special. Uh, I think that it would be good um, if you could spend just a, a brief amount of time talking about a couple of the unique things about Zayathe. Um, mm -hmm. I'm particularly thinking about Flowstone, um, maybe um, maybe the Blood Touched, and a little bit about your your new races because because you you did you you carried over a lot of the character races but then you added several yes. uh, I think that that bring in uh, that that kind of approach that non-human that you were talking about they're they're humanoid they're I mean they're human they're not animal hybrids or something mm -hmm. I mean there's the the fey with the horns right yeah, but then very, and yeah. then there's skin color and and size variations but you might want to talk a little bit about that just to give people a flavor of the world uh, I really did want to um, certainly keep the familiar as part of Zayathe, right? Um, we wanted to have uh, the traditional elven uh, cr characters. We wanted to have the the traditional halflings and and um, you know and the orcs and and these others that are very very important. Now, one of the things that I'm I'm fairly proud of of what we did was well before it sort of got to be a thing, um, we we were at my table many years past there there were no uh, races that were evil or good there, there was none of that kind of thing going on it was all individuals mm -hmm. right and uh, of course that opens up a, a marvelous many many much more marvelous things to, to be able to have uh, have the world be more rich right um, and so uh, we brought all most of the traditional uh, races from 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 the, the SRD, right? And we brought those. But then we made we started down the road mm -hmm. of making some interesting ones. So we did the Gurund, which are really big, blue-skinned individuals with, with very coarse white hair and gold eyes. And they don't really tattoo themselves. They actually use ritual scarring. And they have wonderful lore. They come from the mountains. And I primarily did the Gurund because... Uh, it was really unfortunate in most of the games that, that I played in or people that I played with that, that if they wanted to be a big character, you had to be a, a, a half-ogre or something like that. Right, and so the yeah. Gurund gave people who wanted to be big, because they're like nine foot tall, you know, nine and a half foot tall, and they're brawny and, you know, weigh 350, 400 pounds at the, at the lightweight, you know, all that kind of stuff. So they're, you know, very Andre the Giant-like, right? Um, that kind of an idea. But then we also have the Sarth, and the Sarth are very important to Zyathic lore. And the reason why the Sarth are very important to Zyathic lore is to answer another part of your question, which is what are flowstones? So in the cataclysm, which, which truly broke the world, called the Woe of Ruin, uh, flowstones, it is believed, this lore is still in question, but it is believed that flowstones were created at that time. And these are literally gem 
raw gemstones that Im- that in have magic imbued within them. Okay? The problem with them in their uncut state is they are incredibly toxic and dangerous and corrupting. And so to try to use a flow stone in its uncut state is a di- is a disaster for anyone who might try to do that no matter who they are except except for certain individuals who come from sarth blood they are they are pure sarth blood and they also have the skill and ability to be able to cut the flow stones that enables them to be then used by anyone because it basically the cuts the way they do the cuts removes the toxic emanations and allows them to be used so these are then used in magic items they are used in fusils which are the um which are the magical firearms for lack of a better term mm. uh they are used in all manner of devices and they're actually two different kinds uh so so they are a wonderful addition and and i've gotten so many compliments from people about flow stones and how they how they work and the lore of them and all of that stuff and mike i think you know what i'm talking about pretty well yeah no i i i I, the one thing that uh i've really enjoyed since i started actually getting into the world of zyathe at your table um full disclosure uh i do play a game uh with uh, with alphineas here uh as my dm um and uh uh, is is the the contextual uh reasons for these races right they aren't just like you know filling an archetype right they aren't just like kind of uh uh be, becoming an analog of something that appears somewhere else right uh i mean there are definitely similarities here and there with, with which you can see like some of the influences that have have uh been part of it but uh for the most part it's it's some of the most original and interesting uh stuff i've seen done with uh races in some time well it was important to us um uh it was important for us to kind of break the mold that that you know races are good and evil it was important to us to try to bring even more significant diversity to our world we wanted that um, it was important to us to give um, some interesting options, but it was also, and I, again, I, I said this a little bit earlier, if you're a budding writer and you want to create something, a world, uh, anything, it has to feel plausibly realistic, right? Because you're asking people to suspend their disbelief. And in, in, in trying to suspend disbelief, as we try to, to try to do this, uh, we've all had these moments where we're watching a movie or reading a book and all of a sudden gone, well, that doesn't make sense. Wait a minute. that And all of a sudden you're into this, whatever this story is, right? And, 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 you're, and it's ruined. It, it, it takes you out of it because, because what happened was is whatever they did caused the suspension of disbelief to be broken. Mm, yeah. And so for me, and I'm, I'm really a stickler for this. I'm very much a stickler for this. Everything has to have a plausible why. Mm -hmm. And that's all of the the races that we have made and and all of that and more that are coming. You know, why did they come, right? Who made them? How were they made? In our world, Avova made the first race, which was the humans. And then that taught the other gods that Avova had created how to make peoples, and then those gods would get together, not as an individual god, but they would actually get together and create these various peoples. And all of them have a why. Uh, there's a very wonderful tale that's coming when we travel to Sundestia, which is a southern continent, which is of the Infernathe, who are the fireborn. So the Sarth were originally created to be blessed of the sovereign of fire. But for some unknown reason, right at the end, as the Sarth were being created, the, the, the Sovereign of Fire removed their blessing and placed it elsewhere. And this is why the Sarth can cut flowstones, because they are insensate to arcane magic. 
So sarf in the world of Zayafe cannot be wizards or sorcerers in any way, shape, or form. They can use divine magic because divine magic is bestowed upon them by the gods. But tapping directly into the Zayanthus, either through formula, as a wizard would do, or through this, this tapping like a sorcerer would do, they can't do it. And so that feeds into the lore of the flow stones, right? And all of it is designed to kind of make sense, right? And so they had to learn how to, to do magic as a people because so many of them could not do it. And so they were the ones to harness the flow stones, and they are also the only ones who can cut the flow stones because they are the, insensi the insensitivity to uh, these magics is what also protects them from the toxicity of flow stones. So as you see the circle of the lore and how it brings it to the table and makes it feel real, and all of a sudden you go, oh, that kind of makes sense. So I, I love the Sarth. I, I love their lore. I, Stephen, I can't wait. When, when we were at Genghis Khan, we can nerd out together and I can, I can, <laughs> I can talk to you about some stuff because I think you'll, I think you'll love kind of what we did. Um, you know, I'm looking but, forward to it. Yeah, I, I, I can't wait to, to spend some time with you, my friend. It's, it's going to be wonderful. So let's let's talk for a minute about the uh, the tomb of Guys and Gax. Yes. Uh, now this is this is sort of I, I guess it, it, to me just having known you as long as I've known you and and uh, my familiarity with uh, with Gooey Cube and what you guys have been doing. Um, this this really feels like you're 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 putting you're putting everything out there like you are not holding anything back. This is. Uh, almost, uh, at least for now, the current apotheosis of what Gooey Cube is, um, and and uh, and what what the game means to you and your community that you that you've grown. Well, um, I, you know, Mike, I had this wonderful fortune to to meet Luke, right? And I'm such a fanboy, you know. I, I mean, I, Luke I, I, Gijax, I, Luke yeah, Gijax, yeah, Luke Gijax, just Gijax, so yes, yeah. And I'm yeah. such a fanboy, right? And um, I mean, you see my house. You've seen all the stuff, how much money I've spent in my life, and you know all the painting that I've done. You know, I mean, this mm -hmm. this this is straight up for real for me, right? Um, yes. And, and I your mean, dwarven we, forge collection is very mighty. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, I've definitely, much to Ms. Goo's chagrin, I have probably spent more money than I should have through the years. Um, <laughs> not that I don't love uh, Stefano and the, this wonderful. This amazing thing that he did with creating Dwarven Forge. Another story to tell for another time. <laughs> so actually, the, these bins behind Galactus and everything, that's all Dwarven Forge. And that's not all the Dwarven Forge. I've got more boxes in the garage. Yes, you are uh, sucked but, in too, sir. Just I, right into oh, yeah. Game. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you, your collection is mighty. Like... <laughs> Like I have, I, I have, I have a bit of dwarvenite envy, I guess, uh, <laughs> because, uh, yeah. But anyway, um, uh, so, so I meet Luke, right? So yes, Luke, yes. And we talk a little bit and do some things, and then you know, I, I don't remember exactly how it happened. We corresponded a little bit, and then I, I, I just I, long ago on the map of East Vedestia, I put a little place over by the Mithril Mountains called Geisengax. And I did it absolutely 100% to give a nod to Marvelous Gary. That was my goal. I wanted to give a nod to Marvelous Gary. And if you look at our maps, there are nods all over our maps to all oh, manner yeah. of wonderful, wonderful contributors. So, <laughs> so anyway, so I meet Luke, we begin to correspond, and I, I say, Luke, I'd love to do a project with you. And I've also met um, a, a wonderful other person who works with Luke, Luke very closely. They're very good friends named Matt Everhart. Most people know as Casey Rift. Mm. And I get the chance to, to talk to them and we're talking about stuff. And I, and I said, Luke, you know, I got this place on my map called Geisengax. And if you'd be willing to, to help me work on it, I'd love to do this project with you and do something really special to honor your dad. And he said yes. And so we began the process. And we have gotten to the place where the tomb of Geisengax is now very much a reality. And on February 27th, uh, we will launch 
this Kickstarter with this amazing homage to Gary, uh, uh, who will be played by um, Gerald Geisengax, the ghost. But as you know, uh, and many do not, but if you go to uh, gooeycube.com slash back, you can take a look at all of the things that are going on there, which has truly made me geek out, right? Because we have a very significant number of non-player characters who will be either in the, the adventure or in the campaign setting. And those include people like Ed Greenwood, um, Errol Otis, Larry Elmore, Tim Kask, uh, Stefan Pokorny of Dwarven Forge, um, and quite a number of other amazing legends from the, the last 50 years of, of this wonderful game. And they're all in there, and it's just, I mean, for me, it's like, I just want to go, Spee! you know, this kind of, <laughs> you know, they're like, oh, and my nose is tickling to it at the same time. Um, it's like, it's like, I can't even believe it. Yeah. Well, and, and, but for us to be able to, I mean, I get a little teary eyed right now, um, to be able to, uh, you know, with the loss of Janelle and mm. others that we have lost, and getting on in age myself, right? And to be able to to give um, to give love to people that advance the game. Margaret Weiss made a beautiful character for us, um, mm -hmm. named Archibald Fox. Um, yeah, it's um, it's pretty uh, humbling, and um, and I, I I promise this, um, I will put as as much effort into that as I possibly can to make it magnificent. Um, and like you said, it's kind of like feeling like you're doing an opus, you know, you're mm -hmm. doing something that, that is, that you'll never have a chance to do anything like it again, you know? And, uh, um, I mean, my heroes are in there. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing. And, um, and not just heroes from the old days, we got some new people popping in there. I'm, I'm working on, working on some very interesting folks, uh, from a little more, uh, more uh, contemporary uh, uh, things going on, so mm -hmm. um, we'll we'll just we're just going to keep adding to them as it goes on. We're just going to keep doing it. So uh, nice, uh, you know. And, and we might do an OSR version of this, by the way. Oh, we're going to okay. talk to marvelous Kelsey uh, Dion on Friday and have a discussion about that. So I'm excited to to be able to discuss that, and there may even be a Pathfinder thing. So we're messing around with some discussions and seeing what we can do. And, of course, it depends on how well it does. But, Mike, you know yeah. from our other Kickstarters, we're pretty generous with our stretch goals. And if you go to gooeycube.com slash back, you can actually register. And if you register there, you get um, – and then you back us at the adventure and campaign level for the Kickstarter. There's a thing there called the Gooey Hall. And the Gooey Hall is worth about $200. And you'll get all of that – uh, if you register and back us at the adventure and campaign level before you get a single stretch goal. So nice. We're stepping out hard for nice. our, for our, for our friends. Nice. Gosh, and, getting, and yeah, hold on, I got to grab a tissue because I did get a little tear <laughs> there and my nose is running and, um, I mean, it's, but, but Mike, you know, this is true. I mean, we are losing, we are losing, you know, Gary is gone and yeah, you know, Dave is gone, and and we are losing many of the the pioneers who who began this wonderful thing called TTRPGs. Um, and uh, and I just I just am proud and humbled to to be able to give them some honor, and and that's that's really really exciting. So, apologize for my bit of emotion. <laughs> Don't ever apologize for emotion. It's um, warranted. Yes. Uh, no, like, uh, I mean, just uh, from my standpoint, like, I've, you've been telling me about this for months now. And like, every time I talk to you, there's a new, a new person involved. There's a new awesome thing that, that you can't wait to tell someone about. Like, it's, it's really, really cool. And, um, and yeah, I, I can only imagine just being being organizing something like this. This is a phenomenal, phenomenal undertaking. 
and uh, you know it's the fiftieth anniversary of D and D. Um, you know, and in D, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Aha, Stephen. <laughs> and and I think uh, I think what Gooey Cube it, it really kind of encapsulates. Tomb of Guys and Gags and what you're doing really kind of encapsulates that D and D is 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 for all of us, right? It's not just a game that Wizards of the Coast owns. Uh, it's not just uh, a thing we did when we were kids. It's it's a lot more than that, and and communities have sprung up from it, and people have met and fallen in love over it like it's lifelong friendships yes yes like i mean i mean i would say probably a a, a, in in large part uh like the friendship that steven and i struck up when we were in high school is in large part due to our love of D &D and our love of gaming absolutely Um, well and also um, people people in this more modern day don't don't know this but for guys like us um you know, and I'm older than you, Mike. But for guys like us, mm-hmm. you had to be careful who you told play D and D because you could get oh yeah, bullied, you could get <laughs> beaten up. I mean, you know, I I kind of had two sets of friends. I had my my friends who I didn't tell that I played D and D with, and I had my friends I played D and D with. You know, and yeah. uh, and uh, and they used to give me a rasher of our time. You know, and uh, yeah. fascinatingly though, as time went on, more and more of them began to play D and D. Yes, right? yeah, <laughs> yes, it. It's it, it like my my the ten year old version of me would like his head would explode, um, at the state of D and D today. Uh, but but I think it's it's in, in full disclosure like we we are working with uh, Gooey Cube and Gaxworks on get you know bringing more coverage and and getting more eyeballs on this, uh, you know and uh, but it's it, it it's 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 fun. Like I, I don't want to tease too much of it right now because we've got some awesome content planned for the next several weeks, and uh, and I can't wait to to show it to everybody. This like well, and honestly, this... Mike, Mike, I want to tell you something. You know, we are proud and pleased to be able to also provide sponsorship money to Gaming Trend. You all have been wonderful in this in this space for so long. And, you know, I appreciate that you're helping us promote it. Um, I know darn well that you don't promote things you don't believe in, so that, you know, mm-hmm. that's no trouble there. And and for us, as, you know, as people who, you know, are sort of involved in this community, you know, for us to be able to help support you is, is important as well. And so we are we are pleased to do that. Um, so by Stephen the, by the very definition of, uh, of scratching each other's back. Yes. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which I think in the gaming community, uh, no, no, it's. I think it's. I think it's very common in the gaming community. I mean, I oh don't, yeah, no, I don't. it's it's the only way to do business, as far as I'm concerned, right? Like, you know, it, it's let's have fun, <laughs> right? And let's help each other. Let's let's not, you know, right? we we need to. We've got important things and 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 weighty matters, but let's have fun along the way. Uh, I think that's super important. Yes. Indeed. Um. Well, like I said, we've got a lot of coverage planned. Um, we're going to have an interview with you and Luke. Uh, it probably, I, I believe, it's going to coincide with the launch of uh, of the Kickstarter. Uh, and we've got uh, some deep dive articles that are going to go really in depth about the uh, the guest appearances and, and and the guest NPCs that you've assembled, as well as a lot of the inside jokes and Easter eggs that uh, that you guys are cooking in this thing. Um, it's it's like it's going to be a lot of work, but it's going to be so much fun. Uh, and I can't wait to do it. We're going to, we're going to kick it all off by going to, to Genghis Khan, the one con I go to a year where I do it to have fun. <laughs> right, it's not working. Not it's that not I don't working, have right? fun we're at the other work. cons, but I'm working those. I'm working those. Like, so, uh, I'm going to play. This is, this one's all about play. Uh, and, um, really, really looking forward to seeing both of you there. And uh, and and Luke and and a bunch of other folks that uh, that yeah, we met Richard along the way. Yeah, Jeff Richard from Calcium, I think, is going to be there. Tommy Rice is going to be there. Um, 
uh, just a bunch of, of wonderful folks. And, of course, Donnie and Andrea, uh, who, who run the convention, are magnificent. So uh, also uh, Andrew Valcasas uh, f- uh, from Fate of the Norns is going to be there. Awesome. Uh, I found out just as uh, all of the, uh, the the one session that he had going that was during a free free block for us uh, filled up. <laughs> but uh, but he's going to be it's, he's going to be in the dealer's room. It uh, looks like things are going to be really really awesome. And then of course uh, your campaign is going to be. Uh, just burning white hot during Gary Con. Yes, our, our Kickstarter will end the last day of Gary Con. Excellent, oh, excellent. Nice. Um, yeah, That'll and be fun. Be fun. Yeah, I, honestly, I can't, I can't wait to talk to you and Luke about uh, how you guys are collaborating on this thing. Uh, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave that for for that discussion. Um, but, but yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, hit up the link in the description uh, for the uh, for the Kickstarter um, and and register so that you can get all the the good fun free stuff. Uh, yeah. Also, Mike, just so people know, you can go to gooeycubecom slash back mm-hmm. and do the registration. And even if you don't back us, we got some really cool things you can win. We got a, a really cool little offer there that you can take advantage of. Uh, of a group called the Fair Matraz, which are shapeshifters and how they exist in the world of Zayafe, very interesting people, and how, where they came from and all of that stuff. And oh, nice! So, you know, so you get some freebies even if you don't uh, if you don't uh, want to back the Kickstarter. But yeah. back the Kickstarter, it's going to be great, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> and you can um, also check out the website there for the other products that are out there for the world and what's available because there's plenty of stuff that's already out there. Yeah. Yes, Stephen, that's true. And, and Stephen also, we have some great freebies on our website as well, including a free little adventure that you can download uh, to give you an idea of what we do. Um, because I do, I do believe we make some of the finest materials to aid game masters in, in the, in the industry today. I really do believe that. Um, and now, I know you guys are running uh, some se- game sessions at Genghis Khan. Are there any convention, other conventions this year that you're going to be running sessions at where people can go try out uh, Zayathe and and uh, and the, what Gooey Cube has to offer? Yes, yes, yes. Of course, we will be at Gary Khan. I already mentioned that we will be mm-hmm. at Gen Con in August. Um, Excellent. We, uh, we are looking at trying to get into PAX Unplugged, but it's been, we just every year we have trouble trying to break in the door. So I have to figure out how to break in the door at that one. And there might be a couple of others. Um, though, because of our day jobs, right? I already mentioned I'm in the, you know, my, my day job is the advertising thing. Because of our day jobs, and there's a very high level of, of um, business going on right now, which is important because GUI right. wouldn't exist without our day jobs. <laughs> You know about that million dollars? How to make a the fastest way to a million dollars in the game business is to start have a million, million dollars and go into the yeah. game. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's, yeah. That's, that's me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's uh, that's. Yeah, I didn't that's, really start that's... with two million dollars. Let's not get crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> but it, but it has not been really profitable yet. But it has been the most fun thing that I've really ever done. Um, and, and I and like you know, like I said, I get to meet you two guys. You know, Mike, I get to know you. Steven, I get mm-hmm. to meet you now, and we get to raise a glass together, or eat a chicken wing, or whatever we do. You know, there at Genghis Khan, and um, and you know, I've made friends in Germany, and I've made friends in the Netherlands, and I've made friends in you know all manner of places. You know, and it's just um, it's just been such a wonderful, wonderful journey to to make this world and have people love it and want to be a part of it. It's, Fabulous. And, and 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 if you're interested in becoming part of the community, there is a uh, a thriving Facebook group as well as a a, a very busy uh, Discord server. Yep. Um, yeah. The, so the definitely Facebook check those out. You can probably hit the, the links up Masters. on their site. Yep. The Facebook is called the Gooey Game Masters Den of Enlightenment, which is a terrible name. <laughs> terrible. Like I was thinking that's a great name. Ever. <laughs> it is a bit of a mouthful. No, it needs um, to change. I need to change the dang name. <laughs> what are you? What are you going to change it to? I don't know. Gooey, gooey, gooey goofiness or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Wait, clue. Well, I, you, you <laughs> may have a riot. <laughs> you may have a riot on your hands if you don't watch out. <laughs> Oh, you two guys are marvelous. Thank you for this. This was so fun. So no, fun. thank you. Thank you. Um, and yeah, definitely uh, we'll we'll be talking again. Um, and we'll uh, we'll have a lot of great coverage on Tomb of Guys and Gax coming up. Uh, so definitely keep your eyes on Gaming Trend and our YouTube channels and our social media channels. If for some reason you can't think of the link that you need to go to to sign up for this, just run over to GamingTrend.com and we've got GUI Cube ads all over the place. You can just hit that link and sign up and uh, boom, you're done. Uh, yes, Gaming like, you don't even You don't even have to type. Yes, Gaming Trend I mean, I guess you do. Right, Mike? Yes, Gaming Trend is very GUI. Very GUI. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, 